Once more, it's David Kowalik from Godwit Ministries, and today we're going to continue our series on flesh and spirit. This video is the subject of walking in the spirit. Now, this is a very interesting subject. It's one that there's a lot of controversy around, a lot of different ideas, and I hope that you'll find this helpful. All right, well, let's get into it. I once heard a story about a village chief who was passing on ancient wisdom to his grandson by telling him a legendary tale about two wolves. He said to his grandson, There is a terrible battle raging between two mighty wolves. One wolf is bad. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, resentment, lies, and all those bad things. And then he continued and said, The other wolf is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And this same battle is going on inside of you and inside of me and indeed inside of everyone. The grandson thought about this for a moment and then he asked his grandfather, well, which wolf will win? And the old chief simply replied, the one that you feed. Now, you know, this is a charming story and it sounds so good and true. And I've heard this exact story and other versions of it used as an illustration by preachers to explain the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. However, I would contend that this story has absolutely nothing at all to teach us about the way of the spirit. The struggle that's illustrated here, I would argue, is entirely within the boundaries of the flesh. The mouths of the so-called good and the bad wolves are joined at the gullet and they feed one and the same stomach, the flesh and they satisfy the appetites of the flesh. Obviously, there are many advantages to feeding the so-called good wolf instead of the bad. You'll doubtless live a happier, healthier, and wealthier life. And I've certainly been positively and profoundly affected by the good advice and the helpful insights of you know, psychologists and counselors and scientists and teachers from all kinds of disciplines. And I've witnessed many other people being favorably enriched by them as well. More power to them, I say. After all, the flesh can accomplish many wonderful things and can be the means of moral inspiration and positive action. Nevertheless, whatever the virtuous deeds or material benefits that the flesh may achieve, it remains strictly limited and does not contribute in any way whatsoever to the work of the spirit. Now, this scenario reminds me of a cartoon by Gary Larson that depicted a married couple driving a vehicle on the surface of the moon in a vain attempt to drive back to the earth. And the caption read like this, For heaven's sake, Elroy, now look where the earth is. Move over and let me drive. And that for me is a pretty good illustration of the limitations of the flesh. No matter how hard the flesh works or how far it progresses, it can never arrive at the destination that only the spirit can take us to. Jesus put it succinctly when he said, and I quote, the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. John 6, 63. What this means is that God will not help us. Now, don't misunderstand what I've just said. God does help us, but the help he provides is not a complement to the aspirations of the flesh, you know, making up for our shortfalls. The help that God gives is more like being rescued from a burning, sinking ship moments before it explodes. And the only contribution that we make to this rescue is crashing the ship and then setting it on fire. God's help is 100% of the solution and the flesh adds nothing to it at all. As Paul argues in his letter to the Galatians, and I quote again, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then that means Christ died for nothing. Galatians 2 verse 21. Nevertheless, the flesh desperately desires to have some credit for the rescue. And if you're anything like me, you've probably prayed plenty, that's pretty hard to say, of God help me prayers, such as God help me to be a better person, to overcome my addictions, to control my temper, to forgive my brother, to get along with my sister, to be more devoted and to serve you better. You know those kind of prayers I'm talking about. And all of these prayers sound so noble and wholesome, but for the most part, these prayers are usually nothing more than a petition for divine sponsorship to help the flesh in its endeavor to climb the stairway to heaven. But God 
will not be party to these vain ambitions, no matter how virtuous they may appear. And this was exactly the same problem that the Galatian church was faced with, and the reason that Paul felt compelled to deliver them such a stern rebuke in that letter. In it, Paul reminded the Galatians how they had been miraculously catapulted into faith and received the gift of the Spirit simply by hearing and then believing the truth about Jesus who was crucified. In other words, by believing what God had done for them. That's Galatians 3 verses 1 and 2. In this same passage, Paul rhetorically asked the question, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Galatians 2.2. 2. In other words, did you contribute anything to your transformation by what you did? And the rhetorical answer, of course, is an emphatic no. So Paul continues with another question. After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Galatians 3 verse 3. Again, Paul is stressing the essential truth that righteousness is not in the control of our own hands at any point nor to any degree. It's all spirit or it's nothing at all. There's simply no middle ground here. It's not a tug of war. It's either or. Thus for Paul, the difference between walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit is all in or it's all out. It's for or it's against, either or. But what it can never be is a tug of war. Now, sometimes it may feel like a tug of war between competing good and bad wolves that are inside of us. However, the simple Cain and Abel test reveals this tug of war as nothing more than a self-salvation strategy. When we get caught up in trying to attain spiritual security through religious duty or moral performance, the outcome will always be self-obsession. If we succeed, we congratulate ourselves. And if we fail, as one theologian, P.T. Forsyth, puts it, we end up with a feeling more like mortification than repentance. Mortification in the presence of our ideal self rather than repentance in the sight of God. A loss of self-respect rather than sonship. End quote. Now, under this regime, we end up making ourselves the subject of salvation instead of God. And this kind of self-referential spirituality has no part in the spirit. So even if we succeed in feeding the good wolf with positive thinking and good behavior, we contribute nothing at all to our righteousness before God. Righteousness, as I have explained in a previous video called Wrong Ideas About Being Right, is not under our control, for it is entirely a matter of submitting to God's grace and humbling our flesh in the face of God's mercy. So God will not help us to achieve any kind of satisfaction by means merely of the flesh. Therefore, we must abandon the flesh project of self-justification and embrace the spirit project of graceful reconciliation instead. There's simply no other way. As N.T. Wright has it, when we learn to read the story of Jesus and see it as a story of the love of God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, that insight produces, again and again, a sense of astonished gratitude, which is very near to the heart of the authentic Christian experience." End quote. Little wonder then that the New Testament writers used language that emphasized the divine initiative whenever the Spirit was encountered by using terms such as being born again, John 3, 3 and 7, or being born of the Spirit, John 3, verses 5 to 6, or being baptized in the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 verse 5, or being filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 verse 4, or receiving the Spirit, Acts 8 verse 17 and 10 47, or being ruled by the law of the Spirit, Romans 8 verse 2, or being in the realm of the Spirit, Romans 8 verse 9, walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16, or being led by the Spirit, Galatians 5 18, and there's many more besides. And as far as the writers of the New Testament are concerned, this encounter with the Spirit is like crossing a spiritual event horizon. And something definite, distinctive and discernible happens when someone crosses from flesh to spirit. So later in his letter to the Galatians, Paul wants his readers to appreciate the extent of the distinction between the way of the flesh and of the spirit. When he writes, and I quote, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Galatians 5 verse 17. Now, the word desire that Paul uses here 
could be equally translated as deep yearning or ardent longing. Indeed, the King James Version of the Bible employs the word lust to make the point. So Paul uses this word to speak not only of the self-seeking desires of the flesh, but also of the transforming desires of the spirit. In other words, the flesh lusts after and strongly desires one thing, but the spirit lusts after and strongly desires the other. So often the way of the spirit is portrayed as merely resisting the desires of the flesh, like some kind of wet blanket being used to suppress worldly temptations or something like that. But Paul is mainly speaking here of the positive and the powerful desires of the spirit that overwhelm and displace the desires of the flesh. In the very next verse in this same passage, Paul goes on to say that the believer is therefore led by the spirit, Galatians 5.18. And again, for Paul, being led by the Spirit is not a vague or an indefinite experience. Rather, he captures the idea of being positively steered and powerfully activated by the Spirit in such a way and to such a degree that you will be compelled to go one way or the other. And so he goes on to say, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 16. You'll notice that Paul says, will not rather than try not. However, walking in the spirit does not mean that we will never fall under temptation or morally stumble again, as I'm sure you're perfectly aware. And indeed, that's not what Paul is trying to convey in this passage. Rather, he is saying that the refreshing stream of liberty generated by the spirit will douse the fire of spiritual insecurity ignited by the flesh and cancel all the schemes that the flesh cooks up in order to feel secure. Whether they be the basic desires for selfish gain, you know, the bad wolf, or the seemingly more noble desires for self-salvation through some system of law-keeping, that is, the good wolf. Now, all this reminds me of the story in John's Gospel, where Jesus was disputing with the Pharisees about the differences between slavery and authentic sonship, when he said, and I quote, now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but the son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. John 8, 35 to 36. Now here, Jesus is revealing the difference between the insecurity of the person walking according to the flesh, who, like a slave, is never sure that they really belong and only as good as their last act of service. And they're always hoping against hope that they will be deemed worthy. However, the person walking according to the Spirit is more like a child born into a household who is completely secure concerning his or her place in the family. So if the son lets you have a taste of the kind of sonship that he's always known and enjoyed in his father's house, then you would know what it really means to be wonderfully and outrageously free. Therefore, walking in the Spirit enables us to know to the core of our being that we are completely secured by what God has done for us rather than by what we do for God. We come to see that our status as righteous is an entirely unearned gift. The subsequent relief that this confers upon us produces a spontaneous and ongoing transformation. You know, I remember meeting a man in prison who became a believer after hearing the gospel at a prison ministry meeting. Now, despite his imprisonment, I don't believe I've ever met a more joyful man in my life. He had been convicted of a triple murder and his sentence was for life. But when I saw him, he was free. Ironically, a free man in prison. And to me, this is a perfect illustration of what the Spirit can do for anyone, anywhere. The circumstances and the consequences of your life may remain unchanged, but your heart can be at perfect liberty despite those very same circumstances. And the New Testament is full of examples of people being inexplicably and unreasonably set free. There's something deeply indicative about the way in which the Spirit takes hold of an otherwise hopeless life and turns it upside down. You know, take for instance the story of the woman from Samaria who conversed with Jesus at Jacob's well. You can read this story in John 4 verses 4 through to 42. Now this woman's life was an absolute wreck. She'd had five husbands and was in another de facto relationship when she met Jesus. Nevertheless, by the time their conversation had concluded, 
she was an absolutely changed woman. So changed, in fact, that she ran back to her village saying to everyone and anyone, Come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. John 4 verse 29. The implication being that despite everything that she has done, she was not rejected. And it was this that caused her to lose her shame so that she no longer needed to hide from anyone. She was suddenly and assuredly secure. Even so, I imagine the Samaritan woman's life was still a tangled mess and she didn't just skip off into the sunset singing hallelujah with no further problems to work through. Yet something had changed in her forever. Now she had the necessary confidence to confront her past and a newfound hope in which to face her future. Her circumstances were unchanged, but the trajectory of her life was in an entirely new and miraculous direction. Now we must understand these dynamics before we can meaningfully explore the fruit of the Spirit. For Paul continues in his letter to the Galatians to describe the subsequent outcomes that attend walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit. Firstly, he reveals how anyone still subject to law keeping as a means to achieving righteousness will inevitably remain in slavery to the ambitions of the flesh. He then compiles a list of the subsequent outcomes that include not only the kind of fruit that result from feeding the bad wolf, such as sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, but also those that result from trying to satisfy the appetite of the good wolf, such as idolatry, this is false ideas about God, and witchcraft, which means manipulating the spiritual realm for your own ends or trading with God. And then he goes on to talk about hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now keep in mind that Paul wasn't talking about the you know, so-called sinners outside the church when he wrote this. He was talking about what happens to those who are inside the church when they walk according to the perspective of the flesh. Even among those who've been charged with spiritual oversight, and myself included, I have to say. Conversely, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, Galatians 5, to 23. And this is only an exemplary list of what is on offer through the Spirit. Now, significantly, Paul talks of these qualities as fruit, the natural long-term outcome of walking in the Spirit. Now, obviously, fruit does not instantly appear. It grows and matures over time. And this may be obvious, but it's important to appreciate that walking in the Spirit does not lead to instant moral or spiritual perfection. Instead, there will be a definite and ongoing process of change that can only be attributed to the intervention of the Spirit. It's a slow motion miracle, maybe, but it's a miracle nonetheless. Now, this miracle works like a change of management at a corrupt and bankrupt corporation. Imagine, if you will, that new management takes over this corrupt corporation and they have to begin some immediate and noticeable changes, such as the dismissal of the inept middle managers and a new vision statement. But it may take many years to turn the fortunes of that company around. Over time, there may be the introduction of new management principles, improved work practices, ethical financial systems, and a whole lot more. And obviously there will be challenges and setbacks along the way, but the end result is never in doubt so long as the new management is kept in place. And something like that is true when we walk in the spirit. What this means is we cannot take the relative goodness or badness of a person's behavior as the primary measure of their faith. You know, over the years, I've met plenty of unbelievers who by any human standard are more moral and better socialized and generally more agreeable than some believers that I have known. However, Relative goodness or badness is not what makes you right with God. Naturally, being right with God will make you more moral. No doubt about that. But relative morality is not the measure of righteousness. You know, a criminal who is looking to Christ is in a far better position than a philanthropist who is admiring him or herself. Now, every believer in Christ, whatever their relative morality is, is equal in righteousness, as far as God is concerned, at least. What matters is not how far you have traveled, but the direction in which you are headed. You know, I remember in secondary school learning about the difference between magnetic north and true north. 
magnetic north and true north are in different positions. You know, an ordinary compass will lead you to magnetic north, while a GPS system, a global positioning system, will take you right to true north. Magnetic north wanders about depending on the fluctuations of the Earth's magnetic field, while true north is in a fixed geographical position that never changes. Now apparently, magnetic north can be up to 1,000 kilometers away from true north. Even so, if you follow a compass, it will, relatively speaking, get you into the postcode of true north, but it will never take you to its home address. Similarly, the way of the flesh produces a passable replica of the way of the spirit. But just like the offerings of Cain and Abel, no matter how similar they may be, they are essentially different. The way of the flesh can run a long way on inspiration and motivation. However, these are unreliable and limited by luck. But the way of the spirit, on the other hand, is not subject to the vagaries of emotional motivation or lucky circumstance. And it flies above the clouds of the moment in the light of God's grace. This is the essential difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. Walking in the flesh is like feeding one of those two wolves, but walking in the spirit is a miracle. Thanks for watching.